Okay, so, um, well, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to speak about safe open water swimming. Um, certainly the FINA Sports Medicine Committee welcome the opportunity of a combined session uh, with the coaches. Um, as part of the athlete support uh, team, uh, we're all here to try and uh, uh, permit and allow the athletes to um, compete at the best of their ability. Um, and the integration of sports medicine and sports science um, is important to that. Um, but also in terms of developing practical applications for coaches uh, to then to apply uh, to their athletes. Um, so I'm going to be taking the first part of the, the session, uh, talking about some of the, uh, the background and the complexities and uh, challenges of open water swimming. Uh, and then there will be a seamless transition in the middle uh, to hand over to my colleague uh, David Girard uh, to talk about developments and, and recommendations to ensure ongoing uh, health and well-being of the uh, open water swimming. Um, should you find um, challenges in terms of spotting that uh, swap over, then um, I've got the blue jacket on and Professor Gerard has got the grey jacket on, so hopefully that should become clear. Well, if we go back to the early stages, well, um, early swimming was open water swimming. Um, I think you'll recognise the pontoon start in Paris in uh, 1900. Um, and, and in Athens, uh, the uh, swimming events took place uh, uh, off Piraeus Harbour outside Athens. Um, I think in the background, they are actually are oars rather than the prototype feeding poles that we might see today. Um, but certainly there, uh, there is some historical, a certain amount of romanticism attached with um, open water swimming um, or being able to achieve something that somebody has never done before. Um, Lord Byron uh, famously swum the Hellespont in 1810, um, in recreating the um, Greek myth of Leander. Uh, when uh, Captain Matthew Webb swum the Channel, uh, the English Channel, in 1875, um, he was feted around the, uh, uh, the world um, in, in newspapers. And certainly open water competition, uh, in my country at least, has been uh, regular and taking part for, for over 100 years. Uh, within some of the FINA Grand Prix uh, events, there again there are substantial history. The Capri Napoli event this year was in its 51st uh, year. Uh, open water swimming was introduced at the World Swimming Championships in Perth in 1991 with a 25k, um, and in the Olympic Games in Beijing uh, with the 10k uh, marathon event. Uh, we obviously now have the 5, the 10, and the 25k, and the team event in our world championships. Um, and obviously we share the open water swimming with triathlon and certainly that's been um, uh, a massively increasingly popular uh, sport both uh, at the elite level and indeed at the mass participation. Uh, and we're now seeing open water swimming almost becoming the uh, jogging exposure, explosion of, um, of this decade um, uh, and some of the uh, perhaps recognised um, psychological benefits of repeated um, exposure to cold water are also uh, now being recognised. We certainly know a little bit more about injuries and illnesses and we heard a little bit about this uh, yesterday. This is some of the data uh, that uh, uh, the Sports Medicine Committee along with um, many of our uh, team physicians help collect uh, at the Barcelona um, World Championships. Um, essentially it seems as if um, our open water swimmers uh, are injured and indeed have illnesses about twice as common um, as their swimming uh, uh, counterparts. But there are hazards involved, with, uh, involved in open water swimming, and a lot of those are environmental. Uh, we've talked a lot um, today and yesterday about water temperature and the effects of ambient uh, uh, temperature outside and solar radiation. You might say that um, here, this is a FINA Grand Prix off Dubai, looks quite a nice way of spending an afternoon, but uh, um, you know, the North Sea um, in a winter in this triathlon event is perhaps a somewhat different type of uh, scenario. Uh, and certainly the effects of weather and tides um, ha have an influence here. Uh, there was a lot talked about water quality in advance of, of Rio, and, and I suppose if the water that you're due to swimming actually looks pretty filthy, then it probably is a little bit filthy on the inside. FINA do not, do not have their own um, water quality standards and we tend to apply uh, those of the WHO standards which are essentially related uh, to the chance of you becoming ill 
um, by uh, 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 taking part in activity. So essentially, level standard A is, um, is good for drinking, um, B is good for occupational uh, swimming, um, uh, C is probably not an ideal place to go in, and D, you don't really want to go there. Um, and that's usually related to the degree of contamination by uh, faecal bacteria, um, and they are able to produce uh, counts and numbers that will allow it to uh, be categorized into one of the above categories. But there are other bacteria, um, uh, and cyanobacteria, which are specifically transmitted by uh, water, so vase disease and blue-green algae are, are, uh, are sometimes of an issue, particularly in enclosed bodies of water. Again, there was lots talked about viruses, and, uh, and I just don't think we know enough about viruses. Viruses are very small, and we have millions and millions of them. Um, but what are the significance of um, virus counts uh, within the water is really not understood, um, and they're not used in any of the uh, quality standards um, in terms of determining what is safe and what is not. Obviously, it also depends on what else is in there. You know, too much lead, too much chromium in the water is probably not ideal. Um, and then there's often the challenges with chemicals, and particularly things like pesticides um, and fertilizers, um, which obviously can be uh, washed off into, uh, into water bodies. Um, and paradoxically, that seems to be worse after um, a lot of rain and a lot of deluge, as the um, uh, usual sewerage and uh, water collecting techniques are overrun and, uh, and the spill just goes off into, um, uh, into the bodies and ultimately out into the sea. There's also the things that live and float in the water. Um, there's the things that speed around on the top. And remember, our athletes are not very visible um, uh, with only a small part of them sticking out of the water. And so um, issues with motorized craft, underwater obstacles, that might not be a problem when the tide is in. Uh, but when the tide is out, that might become a problem. And certainly for them, sometimes sighting, knowing which way to go, you know, it's not a great position for um, identifying uh, which direction you need to go into. And obviously, it's with other competitors as well. You know, out there in the pack, sometimes it can be a bit of a dog-eat-dog -dog, uh, type of scenario. Um, and so there may be elements of foul play, which obviously our referees try and keep a, a handle on. Um, but there are uh, issues with regard to blunt injuries, you know, elbows, knees to the head, etc., which may be a problem. In terms of illnesses, um, well, we certainly do see some, some relatively trivial, some more significant. Um, it's not uncommon, particularly in sea swims, to be, become motion sickness or travel sickness, just with the bobbing up and down. We recognize that some of our events are very long indeed. Um, you know, uh, 25 kilometers is three times a regular marathon distance um, on the road, and sometimes you just run out of fuel if your uh, refueling strategy is not there. Obviously, hot environments may predispose to, pre uh, to heat stroke, um, and similarly, cold temperatures um, to hypothermia. Uh, there are cardiac effects on entry and, and leaving it, cold shock, um, and then postural drops um, on leaving the water having been horizontal under a certain amount of external pressure for a period of time. There's also swimming-induced pulmonary edema, uh, drowning, uh, and sudden cardiac death. And unfortunately, to our cost within our um, uh, organization, uh, that's very close to our hearts, having had the, uh, the loss of Fran Crippen back in 2010 um, in a FINA-sponsored event. Um, but if you look beyond that, then certainly you do see signs, and these are just a few examples. Uh, Paul from the internet, um, a swimmer died crossing the channel this year, a family devastated by the swimmer's deaths. And indeed, in the Hong Kong Harbour race, admittedly the mass participation event after the elite race um, this year, um, two uh, people unfortunately lost their lives. So what do we know about deaths in open water swimming? And the answer is not very much. Um, I think this is probably one of the most helpful studies, although be it in triathlon, uh, the USA Triathlon Fatality Incident Study. Uh, they looked at eight years of um, uh, USA triathlon sanctioned events, um, and they recorded 43 in competition deaths. Five of those were in the cycling event. One unfortunate person was a spectator. It was got hit by a bike as well. Um, but in terms of the non-traumatic deaths, 80% um, of those were seen in the swim. Overall sort of incidence seems comparable to mass participation, fun runs, things like that. London Marathon, uh, for example, has, a injury, has, an, has a death rate of about one in 75. Uh, thousand participants, but it obviously seems to be a particular preponderance to the swim component of it as opposed to um, uh, perhaps at the end of the race. 
And so if we think about that a little bit more, well, these are all meant to be athletes who are meant to be fit and healthy. They've all trained for that. You know, it wasn't as if they're impending um, uh, medical problems. It also seems something to be about competition rather than training as well, although we have no way of um, knowing what's happening in terms of the training um, environment, but it seems to be more competition related and similarly more in an open water environment rather than in a pool environment. We've said that these deaths seem to be early rather than late, so it's not clearly related to fatigue or to the length of the race. Um, and these athletes were uh, retrieved, admittedly at all ages, there were some young and some old, um, and underwent CPR at the, uh, at the scene. And the feeling is that perhaps this is more of a sudden cardiac death rather than a hypothermia or a drowning type of phenomena. Following post-mortem, some of them were found to have the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or structural abnormalities uh, within the heart or coronary artery disease, but some didn't really have anything at all, and so that raises the question as to whether this was an electrical problem um, leading to a cardiac arrhythmia uh, that might have caused the terminal um, event. Uh, and Michael Tipton has talked about the autonomic co conflict. The autonomic nervous, service, nervous system is essentially the automatic nervous system um, that controls many of our um, unrecognized things, our heart rate, our breathing rate, you know, how our bowels move, um, uh, sweating, etc. Um, and there are some uncontrolled uh, responses and reflexes that we have. I think probably most people are familiar with the cold shock response. That's when you go into the sea and it's, uh, it's pretty cold. You get an intense stimulation from your temperature receptors in your skin, in your skin uh, which leads you to that gasp response and then uncontrolled hyperventilation and putting your heart rate up um, uh, impressively. Similarly, there's a diving response. And if you wet the your face or particularly the back of your throat and that simulates the other side of the nervous system, the parasympathetics, which tends to lead you to breath holding and a reduced heart rate. These effects seem to be exacerbated by exercise, by competition and interestingly by anger as well and perhaps this conflict at the break of breath hold might lead to an arrhythmia, particularly in those people who might be susceptible due to ischemic heart disease or some of the iron channel channelopathies um, or the long QT syndrome, uh, some of which we've heard mentioned earlier on today. Just in terms of a little bit about cold water immersion, well, um, you know, there's a, uh, whenever somebody is put into, uh, into water, unless that's pretty warm, there will be an immediate um, uh, uh, connection between the skin and, 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 the, and the water surrounding water, um, uh, and heat will start to be lost. Um, that's a fairly rapid conductive type of heat loss, and it starts up a, a gradient between the relatively warm core and the relatively cold periphery. We find that as muscles are cold, uh, become increasingly more cold, um, they start becoming impaired, and, and it probably is relatively unusual for people to become hypothermic um, with less than 30 minutes type of exposure. We know that when people are marooned in cold water, then they adopt the help position because exercise actually accentuates that body cooling. And people have again proposed swim failure um, as a cause of drowning in this circumstance. So swimming in cold water, it tends to affect your arms more than your legs. It reduces your coordination and power by about 3% for every degree colder that they get. Uh, the vasoconstriction reduces uh, muscle blood flow, reduces oxygen to the, uh, uh, to the muscles and reduces uh, metabol metabolite, met metabolite removal. So you end up with a more anaerobic metabolism, early depletion of your carbohydrate, early onset of fatigue. And you get this type of scenario where you have an increasing uh, stroke rate, your stroke length goes down, your body starts to fall and then there's that terminal uh, vertical dog paddle before ultimately people um, sink. So there's a recent uh, review in, in the literature looking at proposed mechanisms of swimming related death um, by uh, Lawrence Cresswell from, from the States um, and I think it's only acknowledged that there was poor and inconsistent data out there and so we don't really know um, but perhaps on balance the feeling was that perhaps cardiac arrhythmias were the most likely cause of swimming related death weren't able to say one way or the other about uh, swimming-induced pulmonary edema, but probably that it wasn't hypothermia or hyperthermia. So we've identified some of the problems with regard to open water swimming, and now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Professor Gerard, to talk about some of the developments and solutions. Thank you, Kevin. This is that seamless transition he was referring to. We 
We're going to uh, retitle this talk, uh, Open Water Swimming, the long and the short of it. Um, however, moving right along, I think the most important message for me to leave to the coaches in the audience today is the fact that the Sports Medicine Committee of FINA and the Technical Open Water Swimming Committee have engaged what we believe to be the best minds in the business to undertake uh, providing us with the scientific evidence that can best inform the judgment that we need to make over the safety of our swimmers. I think the piece of the jigsaw that we've yet to put in place is consultation with coaches and athletes themselves to determine how this might best suit our sport and our particular discipline of open water swimming. We are unfortunately in, a, in, a, in an arena of research where there's been very little information up till now and we've been using what we assume to be best guess rules for what we should be applying to this endurance event, particularly where these events are staged internationally in cold or warm water. And you will be aware that uh, uh, FINA, uh, in conjunction with the International Triathlon Union and the IOC, has put significant funding into uh, research both at the University of Otago in New Zealand, at the University of Portsmouth in the UK. And uh, over the last uh, day, those of you that have been attending the conference will have received and, and understood from the, the science and the scientists who produced that information the outcomes of their research. We know, as, um, as Kevin has already indicated to us, that there are well-known physiological responses that occur in, in response to immersion both into warm and cold water, and the water temperature itself is a, an external stimulus, as are the ambient uh, characteristics of wind chill factor and radiant heat. The amount of time you spend in that environment, the way that you metabolically produce heat, lose heat, whether or not you've got external or internal insulation, all these factors together with skill and habituation and your state of health are important uh, in, in the way that your body responds. The warm water research that was conducted at Otago came up with, I think, fairly solid evidence that we can safely assume that 31 degrees centigrade is safe for the events that we stage in the FINA circuit. Um, there were a huge amount of, of, of data collected and, and uh, Jim Cotter and Carl Bradford yesterday went through these, these data in detail. All I'll say is that there was some comparability in terms of sweat rates and dehydration comparable to terrestrial sport. Um, one of the important findings of the research was that athletes in the warm water environment are very reliable responders to their body condition. So their perception of how they felt correlated fairly accurately, in fact very accurately, with the physiological and objective data that we were recording. And that the speed of swimming was not necessarily going to increase their core temperature. Um, so as a, as a consequence of this, the, uh, the, the FINA Bureau has accepted the recommendation scientifically proven and, and evidenced now that uh, the op optimum temperature or the upper limit of temperature in the regulations at 31 degrees gives us some confidence that we're keeping our athletes safe. But no one single figure is going to ever overcome the need and the necessity for vigilance, the vigilance of coaches and other people who are support staff observing athletes in, in any of these environments. I won't go through the details that uh, were so clearly enunciated yesterday in the, in the presentation. Uh, these, this quick summary here talks about some of the outcomes. Um, and I'll move now to the cold water comparable um, study. And, and this is only just recently been concluded and, and we were indebted to having the presence of um, a Jane Saysell with us yesterday and Jane's in the audience today to help answer any difficult questions you might ask of me after this. Um, but essentially uh, Jane and her colleagues came up with some very, very interesting findings. Some of the variabilities that they related to in terms of athlete somatotype quite clearly the influence of cold water immersion is worse where athletes are tall and lean. 
and that relates, of course, to the physiological insulative effects of, of uh, fat, the lean mass of, a, of an athlete at this level. And I think it's important for us to um, remind ourselves that we are talking about the elite end of the spectrum. And Kevin gave some important data and, and some recent revelations over um, morbidity and mortality in mass participation events. And clearly, uh, we in FINA, looking at the elite end of the competitive spectrum, have to work within that capacity to provide for our top end competitive swimmers the most reliable and safe environments in which they could compete. One of the important things I thought that, that Jane reflected yesterday on from the Portsmouth study was that in the cold water swimming research, swimmers were far less reliable reporters of their, their status. So dissimilar to the warm water research, we can't rely on how the swimmer says they're feeling and relate that to objective measures. So I think that's an important thing. The other important point that Jane uh, emphasised uh, yesterday was the the, the after drop, the cooling upon leaving the water and how important it is for, for us to maintain surveillance of swimmers from a, a cold water immersion uh, for, for at least an hour post event. The cold water swimming research, as I've said, is, is, um, is influencing the approach that we have to the lower limit rule change, which is the, the imminent change that's got to be made in, in FINA safety. There's still some debate and some concern because, of course, this will influence the, the use of, of wetsuits, which has been an innovation that, that FINA has denied the existence of for many, many years whilst in triathlon, notwithstanding the fact that the triathlon swim is, is only a 20 minute, 1500 metre sprint. Uh, we're talking about athletes in our um, disciplines uh, swimming uh, a five and a 10 kilometre event at our World Championships, and then of course a 25 metre, a 25 mile a kilometre event in the World Champs, the marathon swimming Olympic event, of course, at 10k. So we're talking about immersion in the water of up to, to five hours. So I think the information that we're gathering, the pool of information, the expertise of the scientists who have helped us are giving us an idea of, of what a, a practical, and acceptable rules and guidelines for uh, limiting the upper and lower limit of water temperature for the uh, competitive events that, that I'm referring to. And time doesn't permit me to repeat the important uh, other factors of the research that, that uh, Jane and Carl and Jim related to yesterday. So turning to the events themselves, having dealt very briefly with the science behind the information that we've obtained, the event organisation, the responsibility of the host committee under the FINA banner that's staging an event uh, requires specific organisational skills and capacity. There are rules and guidelines in place. There are a, a small, the necessity for a small army of officials to ensure the safety of athletes on the water and in the water and then of course post event. The safety plan associated with any open water safety event, as Kevin has already indicated, must ac accept the fact that th there is significant importance in knowing your environment and the location, the quality and the temperature of the water, the ambient temperature, the tidal influences and the like. The safety plan also extends into the con con conducting of the race. Uh, the course design, the layout, is it an out and back course, is it a circular course? How visible will the athletes be at all times to the uh, escort craft and the number of craft you have on the water? And we have formulae that we often operate at these events to ensure that lifeguards are available, they're visible to the athletes in the water, and that feeding stations, communication with coaches as the swimmers come past the feeding station, the athletes wearing transponders, GPS recording their position and tracking them are all very, very important. And lastly, of course, emergency procedures. We need to have in place uh, sufficient medical and paramedical staff to ensure that not only on the water are athletes in distress acknowledged and recognised and retrieved, but they're got to shore quickly where appropriate medical support is available where there is equip equipment able to resuscitate them in 
from whatever state of distress they're in. And then, of course, transport to a secondary care facility if, if, if necessary. The other important message, of course, for the coaches, and this is the domain of the coaching, in preparing the athlete for the event and the athlete themselves to become familiar with the race, to have their feeding plan well established. Um, the course, uh, the organisers of the event, of course, uh, considering the importance of health declaration, where does the liability and where does the um, responsibility um, start and finish in terms of participation in these events and that's a legal issue that I won't get into and I don't have the qualifications to provide you with the answers to but quite clearly athletes need to be acclimatised, prepared and trained for the appropriate nature of the event that they're competing in. Um, references made by Kevin earlier with respect to the response of the body in terms of anxiety, the anger, the, the emotion associated with competition. And the one remaining piece, I think, of important research that we've got to do is to translate some of the laboratory work we've done in cold and warm water in the flume to field studies. And I think FINA needs to spend some time and money and consider the financial implications for the scientists getting out to work with the coaches and the athletes and to do more field studies. The monitoring of athletes by anybody observing, as I said, is the single most important thing. It's not a, a number which indicates the water temperature. It's the, observer, the, the observation, the continual su surveillance of, of the athlete by the coach and other observers. In both the cold and warm water studies, we, we concluded that there were no significant signals that might uh, indicate to us impending disaster or doom. We looked at things like body position, stroke rate, um, the cadence and the rhythm of the, of the swimmer. Coaches might perceive and might have a good idea of how their swimmer is or is not performing. Unusual, uncharacteristic behaviours as they come past a feeding pontoon might be the only clue that somebody is not quite on song and that this could be the precursor or the the, the only signal that, that things are, are going amiss. But it, it's often a very imprecise science, but surveillance is critical. After the race, of course, there are a number of strategies that need to be implemented, and most of these will be well, um, you'll be well aware of, and I think coaches would put them into place. But I would also underscore the importance of the one hour post-event monitoring, particularly coming from a cold environment and the effect of the after drop. So the challenges of open water swimming are very self-evident and I think you've heard both the, historically from Kevin and, and some of the, the factual data that we've got from mass participation events. We've, we've seen the, the data from the injury and illness uh, studies. We, we know about the, the um, overarching issues relating to impending cardiac death, which we think is probably um, associated with more cardiac arrhythmias induced by a number of the mechanisms and the pathophysiologies that were mentioned earlier today and, and Kevin touched on. I think the guidelines for open water swimming, the safety, the medical plan, and our managed role as, as uh, not only physicians, but as coaches, as scientists, as support staff for our swimmers, um, will we hope make this spectacular event uh, continue to be spectacular, continue to draw crowds, to continue to draw the interest of the world in what, as, as Kevin has said, has become the, the sort of the jogging phenomenon of, of the, the early 60s and 70s. Now mass participation in these events is attracting a lot of people. So I'll conclude there by saying that FINA is very, very sensitive to the needs to make this event safe, this environment safe, and I can assure you that the Sports Medicine Committee, the Technical Open Water Swimming Committee, and soon the coaches and the athletes, I think, will combine to come up with a package that we think embodies the best science, the information we've received from the laboratory testing, and hopefully that will be enhanced by future field studies. So thank you very much for allowing Kevin and I to present this work this afternoon. Thank you.